Okay, hey guys. So this is like the fourth or fifth time I'm trying to record this exam review. So hopefully the audio comes out fine and everything works. I'm using my mom's laptop now. So hopefully this works out fine. So here's the attendance QR code like always. Um, please scan because that'll be great. So we can keep having tutoring. And I forgot to put my contact slide, but you guys know either Facebook Messenger or by my email. And some of y'all have my number. Um, either way, I respond to any of y'all's questions. And I know this is like the day before the exam, but I just been having really like bad laptop issues all weekend. I don't know what's been going on. So first we're gonna start with legal and ethical. We're just gonna do the exam one review first and then get into the exam two content since this exam covers weeks one through six. So voluntary admission, the client or the client's guardian seeks admission for care. The client is free to sign out of the hospital with psychiatrist notification and prescription anytime that they want. Um, detaining a voluntary client against his or her own will is termed false imprisonment. The client retains full civil rights. The client agrees to receive treatment. Um, informed consent must be obtained from the patient because they're not incompetent when they're voluntary, voluntarily admitted. So these patients feel like they need the help. So like a good example of this is like, if you have depression and then you go in and you wanna get checked out, but you can just leave the next day because you came in voluntarily. And then these patients will take their meds and go to therapy on their own. Involuntary admission. So the client did not seek treatment and came in against their will. So a court hearing will determine if the client may be released from the hospital or detained for further treatment and evaluation, or if they need to be committed to a mental facility for an undetermined period. So why might involuntary admission be necessary? So the client can either be a danger to themselves or others, so they might start to have suicidal ideations or homicidal ideations, and with a plan and means to carry that out. They can also be mentally ill and in need of treatment, so they're experiencing true psychosis, or they're unable to provide for their own basic needs, so they can't perform their ADLs. And then at the bottom, so I just put like what the SI means and HI and then true psychosis and like ADLs and all that stuff. So rights for minors. So a minor is anybody under the age of 16. So the nurse has the legal authority to administer psychotropic drugs to adolescents and children under the age of 16 with the consent of the parent or legal guardian. So when you have a minor that's um, been admitted, you need to make sure that we have that consent before we start giving them anything. And then the only time that we can give stuff without consent is if is if it's an emergency. So like if there's an emergency situation and it's like life or death, then you can go ahead and give the dose. But like on a regular basis, you need to make sure that we have consent from their guardian before doing anything. And then duty to disclose. So information sometimes must be released in life-threatening situations without the client's consent. So in the event of a specific threat against an individual, uh, against an identified individual, the healthcare professional has a legal obligation to warn the intended victim of the client's threats of harm. So this came from the Tarasov versus Regents of University of California case. I think if I'm remembering correctly, like I think a student was saying they were going to harm somebody and like they took their threats seriously and I think they actually ended up killing that person. I don't know if that's like extremely accurate, but I feel like it's something like along those lines. So with duty to disclose, the nurse has to report any threats made by the patient to the treatment team just for like their safety and everybody else's safety. And then patient rights. So patients have right to treatment. So any medical, psychiatric care and treatment is provided to everybody that's admitted to the hospital. They also have the right to refuse treatment um, but for this, it really just depends on their mental state at the time. So if they're like experiencing true psychosis, like they're having that break from reality and they refuse the med, you have to take into consideration their state of mind at the time. Like, you know that they need the med and so they're not really refusing it. So you would go ahead and get it, give it to them anyway. But if they're like, you know, coherent and like in their right state of mind and they just say they don't want the med, then that's fine. Like, for example, when I was in clinical, um, I had to give a patient like Colace and um, Miralax and she didn't want it. And so I didn't give it to her because she refused it. And so like a situation like that is fine because she said she already had diarrhea. So we didn't want to give it to her anymore. Um, and then they also have the right to inform consent. So that's based on self-determination. So informed consent must be obtained by physician, 
or healthcare professional to perform treatment or procedure and the nurse is the witness. And then the psychosis does not waive this right. So you still have to obtain consent either way. Even if they are having like a psychotic episode, you still have to get consent. So next we're going over on to therapeutic communication. Sorry, I'm talking like really fast. I just wanna get this uploaded for you guys because I know your exam's like at 8 a.m. tomorrow. So principles of communication, so the do's and don'ts and like verbals and nonverbal cues. So with um, psych patients, you really wanna be able to establish that trust. Um, like you don't wanna like for like nonverbal things, you don't wanna be with your arms crossed or like making faces at them or anything like that because then they won't feel comfortable enough. Or like they won't feel like you're trustworthy for them to like tell you things. Um, you also wanna be non-judgmental. So if they're telling you a story, you don't wanna be like, why would you do something like that? Or why would you say something like that? Cause then they just feel like they're being judged. So always wanna actively listen and like be engaged and have like kind of, um, you know, like a neutral kind of presentation. So it seems like you're still engaging, but like you don't wanna come off judgmental. You also shouldn't give your patient options. Like just tell them, like you're doing what you're going to do so like don't ask them if you can you take their blood pressure just tell them I'm going to take your blood pressure now because with some psych patients they'll be like no you can't take my blood pressure no you can't do this but you know you have to do it so you don't want to give them options when it's not necessary you know I mean when it's when it is necessary like when you need that certain thing done um never give false reassurance and don't say things like everything's going to be okay um, and then focusing and refocusing. So if you happen to be in a group setting and they all begin to talk at the same time and start to lose focus of the group therapy, you really should bring them back to the purpose of why we're in group therapy so it doesn't go somewhere that it shouldn't be going and that it's focused solely on the purpose of the group therapy. So maintaining silence. So why should we maintain silence when dealing with these patients? It's because they just wanna be heard. So you can provide acknowledgement and like give your opinion, but make sure what you're saying has to do with what they're talking about. And like, you're not judging them or like, you know, accusing them, anything like that. So we just wanna have like that active listening. Also doing open-ended questions so that they can continue to tell you about their problems or whatever it is they may be talking to you about. And then some phrases you should avoid are like, you should, you can't, I think that's bad, right, wrong, or nice. Um, if it were me, I would do this or anything like that. And then the biggest thing is asking them why, like, why would you do that? Why did, like, you know, just like sounding like you're accusing. Next, we're going over anxiety. So what is anxiety? Anxiety is a feeling of apprehension, uneasiness, uncertainty, or dread resulting from a real or perceived threat. It will invade the core of the personality and erode feelings of self-esteem and personal worth. So it begins in infancy in Erickson's trust versus mistrust. And remember, we went over all those stages for both PEDS and the first psych exam. So kind of just brush up back on those. Um, it's a fear of the unknown. And remember, anxiety is purely objective. So we won't know how anxious a person is unless we ask them. So when we we're dealing with um, anxious patients, we want to ask them, like, what's your scale? Like what's your anxiety level on a scale of one to 10? And then again, we need to validate with the patient because it's objective based on certain things. And then anxiety is caused by biochemical imbalance. So basically decreased GABA causes anxiety. And then when there's an increasing GABA, there's less anxiety, just to put it in like, you know, simple terms. And then also remember that anxiety is a normal response to stress. Like it's not unnormal to have, like it's not uncommon to experience anxiety, but our role as a nurse is to decrease the client's anxiety and like prevent it from escalating. Cause remember from exam one, we don't want it to, you know, get to severe and panic because then it's just like getting worse and worse. So the first level is mild and this is considered the good level of anxiety. So it's associated with normal experiences of everyday living and allows an individual to perceive reality in sharp focus. So when they're experiencing mild anxiety, they're still able to see, hear, and grasp information and problem solving becomes um, a lot more effective in this level. So these individuals are alert and their perceptual field is increased and they're very motivated to learn. So some signs and symptoms of mild anxiety are slight discomfort, restlessness, irritability, malattention relieving behaviors like nail biting, foot tapping, finger tapping, and fidgeting. 
So some examples of when you could experience mild anxiety are like if you're lost and you're looking for someone to ask for directions or if you're like in a new place and you're just looking for someone to ask or a place to ask. Um, testing anxiety is considered mild anxiety. And then like just your everyday experiences are like considered mild anxiety. And then ideally, this is the level we wanna stop at because again, um, these patients are like able to, you know, grasp information and use their problem solving. And remember they can use those like relaxation and breathing techniques as well. And, you know, like guided imagery and stuff in this level. So the next level is moderate anxiety. So their perceptual field is narrow and the individual sees, hears and grasps less information. So the person focuses on their immediate concern and they have selective attention. So only certain things in the environment are seen or heard unless they're pointed out. So we're redirecting our focus. And then in moderate, individuals are still able to learn and problem solve, but not as well as they would if they're experiencing mild anxiety. So here they can still do like the guided imagery and breathing and relaxation techniques, but they won't do it as well as they would if they're experiencing mild anxiety. So some signs and symptoms of moderate are tension, pounding heart, increased heart rate and respiratory rate, perspiration and mild somatic symptoms like gastric discomfort, headache, urinary urgency, also voice tremors and shaking can be noted. So an example of when someone would experience moderate anxiety is like if you take your kid to the playground and then you turn around and they're not there anymore. So then that would be considered like moderate anxiety. And again, like they don't pay attention to things in the environment because you know their perceptual field is a lot more narrow and they're only focused on their immediate concerns. And again, they won't function as well as a person with mild anxiety. So severe anxiety, um, their, uh, their perceptual field is greatly reduced. And so they'll begin to ruminate in this um, level of anxiety and they have trouble focusing on the environment. So a person may appear like dazed and confused and they will not be able to learn or problem solve like at all. Um, like they won't be able to like implement, you know, guided imagery and like breathing techniques. So um, I forgot to put it on the slide, but remember ideally, Severe, if we want to give like an anxiety, an anti-anxiety med, this is the level that we would want to give it. So like boost bar would probably be given or like an, or not boost bar because it takes a little bit longer to kick in, but like, you know, like an emergency, like anxiety med would be given during this stage. Um, so some signs and symptoms are headache, nausea, dizziness, insomnia, trembling, increased heart rate, hypervent hyperventilation, and they might start to feel that sense of impending doom or dread. So all their behavior is directed at relieving their anxiety. So they need a lot of direction to focus on something else. So some examples of when someone could experience severe anxiety are losing, learning a loved one has been in an accident or just died unexpectedly, losing their job, or you know anything that was just like sudden, like they didn't expect it. So they're not able to retain any information or see or hear things in their environment because remember they're ruminating. So whenever you're dealing with these types of patients, make sure we're giving them concrete statements. So everything is straight to the point to like sit on the bed or take deep breaths, like very simple commands. We don't wanna give them too much at once because they won't be able to grasp it. And then again, we wanna redirect these patients to help them decrease their anxiety because we don't want them to get to panic. So with panic, it's the most extreme level of anxiety. So it's associated with dread, terror and impending doom. So remember that panic can be paralyzing because the patient feels and thinks like they're gonna die. So we really wanna avoid them from getting to this level. Um, the individual is unable to process what's going on in the environment and they may lose touch with reality. So it leads to exhaustion and death if it's prolonged and they cannot communicate or function properly. So some signs and symptoms are pacing, running, shouting, screaming, withdrawal, hallucinations, false sensory perceptions like seeing people or things that aren't actually there. So some examples of when panic anxiety can be experienced are if they're a victim of a crime or like living through a disaster, like maybe like a hurricane or a tornado or something like that. And again, we really want to avoid panic anxiety. And panic anxiety is considered sympathetic because of fight or flight. And it wouldn't be considered parasympathetic because the parasympathetic is not kicking in and calming them down. And again, if panic anxiety is experienced for too long, it can lead to exhaustion and death. So we really don't want them to get to this stage. 
And then if um, the med wasn't given in severe, then we can also give it in panic as well. But severe is ideally where we want to start implementing medications. So the intervention. So um, remember, safety is the most important intervention for dealing with anxiety patients. Um, we also want to recognize their anxiety, establish trust with the patient, modify the environment by setting limits or limiting interactions with others to not um, increase their anxiety anymore or, you know, things like that. And then setting limits so they don't harm themselves or any, on anything. Um, don't criticize their coping mechanisms because if that's what works for them, then that's what works. Um, we also want to provide creative outlets. So that's for like people that are experiencing like mild or moderate that can still, you know, process things and grasp information. Um, we wanna also monitor for those signs of impending destructive behavior, promote relaxation techniques such as breathing exercises or guided imagery. And remember again, those really only work in the mild and moderate levels of anxiety. Um, we also wanna monitor their vital signs, administer anxiety medication as prescribed. And remember the ideal stage to start implementing medications is severe. Um, don't force the client into situations that provoke anxiety. And then the immediate nursing action for a client with anxiety is to decrease stimuli in the environment and provide a calm and quiet environment for them. And then just like more general intervention, so we wanna recognize the anxiety to redirect them and not let it escalate. Um, safety, again, is the key for everything. So providing those creative outlets, again, for like mild to moderate level anxiety. So like deep breathing, inhale, exhale with them. And then remember, no guided imagery in the panic or really severe state, but if it's mild or moderate, you can. So if they happen to be around a lot of people and they're being really loud, you can decrease their stimuli and take them back to a room and do guided imagery and things like that, or like just like deep breathing exercises just to calm them down. Next, we're going over defense mechanisms. Um, I'm not gonna read all the definitions because I gave them to you guys for exam one. So I feel like you guys should still kind of remember them a little bit. And I don't wanna prolong the recording any longer than it has to. So what are defense mechanisms? They're autonomic coping styles that protect people from anxiety and maintain self-image by blocking feelings, conflicts, and memories. So uh, just remember that defense mechanisms, you don't know like you're doing it, it's just done unconsciously. So like if you feel a perceived threat, like you're, you'll just automatically react. Like it's not something that you think about doing. So remember there's compensation, denial, displacement, dissociation, identification, um, intellectualization, introjection, um, isolation, projection, rationalization, reaction formation, um, regression, repression, splitting, sublimation, suppression, and undoing. Um, and then another reason why I didn't really read over the definitions is because there's only nine miscellaneous questions. So there can't be like too many questions from exam one. So, you know, kind of just review them to yourself. Just make sure you know the difference, like know what each one is, but I wouldn't focus too much on defense mechanisms because I don't think she'll ask too many questions about it. And then just like a brief med overview. Um, if you still like want to go more in depth with the meds, go back and look at the other PowerPoint that I uploaded for exam one, like my med review. That one's like a lot better than this. I kind of just like summarized it for this. So benzos, remember that they're highly addictive and the major indications for benzos are anxiety and insomnia. So the different meds are diazepam, Xanax, Ativan, and Clonopin. So remember benzos cause sedation, so you can't give them with another CNS depressant because they're already causing sedation. And then we also wanna monitor addiction with these because remember they're highly addictive. So when taking a patient off of benzo, we need to taper off because it can cause seizures. And then the antidote is flumezanil or romazicon for benzos. For non-benzos, the most common used one is boost bar. So what do we need to know when taking boost bar? It is more effective. It's most effective when they haven't taken a benzo, but it also does take a while to work. So they may be prescribed Xanax and boost bar at the same time, and then they'll decrease the Xanax dose. So all benzos are ideally used for short term because they can cause addiction. And then again, remember, 
non-benzos aren't addictive. So Boost Bar is not an addictive medication. Oh, and I think I said a couple of slides ago that Boost Bar takes two to four weeks. I don't really, I think I was thinking of antidepressants, but um, still Boost Bar does take a while to kick in. So, and then also um, it should not be given to patients that have hepatic problems. So SSRI, so what should the nurse monitor for when the patient's on anti antidepressants? So increased suicide risk. Um, and then remember these, this is where I got the two to four weeks from, sorry guys. So they take a while to kick in, so about two to four weeks. So while they're taking it, they'll have the energy, but they'll still be depressed. So remember, um, SSRIs block the reuptake of serotonin. So the different meds are Prozac, Paxil, Lexapro, Zoloft, which is a big one, and then Celexa and Effexor. So the side effects are GI upset and then the three S's, so sexual dysfunction, stomach, and serotonin syndrome. And then remember, serotonin syndrome is just when there's too much serotonin in the body. So the main signs and symptoms are fever, confusion, hypomania, tachycardia, diaphoresis, discoordination, and seizures. And then like the treatment or like the antidote for SSRIs or benzodiazepine. Tricyclics, so um, the MOA, it blocks the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine, just like SNRIs. So the meds are anaphrenil, Senequan, Pamelora, Elevil, Tofranil, and Ascendin. So some side effects are the, uh, for tricyclics are the anticholinergic effects. So they can't pee, can't see, can't spit, can't shit because it like dries everything out. Um, and then tricyclics cause orthostatic hypotension as well. So if somebody comes, with, comes in with toxicity, they'll show coma, convulsion, and cardiotoxicity. So since it can cause cardiotoxicity, we wanna have these patients on an EKG. And then the antidote for a tricyclic um, like overdose is either activated charcoal, um, sodium bicarbonate, or diazepam. MAOI, so they decrease the metabolism of serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Um, the different types of meds are Nardal, MSAM, PAMATE, and MARPLAM. So with MAOIs, it will increase their blood pressure. They can also have muscle twitching, intracerebral hemorrhage, and then hypertension crisis is the like, biggest side effect from MAOIs. So with hypertension crisis, they'll have a headache first, and then it'll be followed by neck stiffness, nausea, vomiting, and then tachycardia. Um, hypertension crisis occurs because the liver cannot break down tyramine. So when we have patients taking MAOIs, we want to teach them to avoid any foods with tyramine in it. So foods that are aged, fermented, or pickled, because then it could cause them to go into hypertension crisis, and we want to avoid that. So with MAOIs, we also want to give these meds at night because they can cause insomnia. And then for this med, we want to do the washout period. So it's just basically the time it's the time between the start of a new med and the stopping of this medication. Mood stabilizers, basically just lithium. So either it can be escalith or lithobid. Or lithobid. Um, make sure you remember the lithium toxicity levels because it's very narrow. It's between 0 0.6 and 1.2. So when they're taking mood stabilizers, we're always checking their lithium, bun, creatinine, TSH, sodium, and water because hyponatremia can cause lithium toxicity. So the water will flush out the lithium. So if they're, if they're experiencing mild lithium toxicity, so between 1.2 and 1.5, they'll have apathy, decreased concentration, slight twitching, and then coarse tremors. If it's moderate lithium toxicity, which is 1.5 to 2.5, severe diarrhea, vomiting, tinnitus, blurred vision, and tremors. And then severe lithium toxicity, which is anything above 2.5, they'll have nystagmus, dysarthria, which is speech difficulty due to um, impairment of the tongue visual or tactile hallucinations, oliguria or anuria, um, confusion, seizures, coma, or death. So make sure you know um, what happens at each level of toxicity. So know what occurs at mild, know what occurs at moderate, and know what occurs at severe. And then the treatment, um, irrigate the bowels and just stop the med. And then anticonvulsants, so they increase GABA. So the indications for this are bipolar and schizoaffective schizo disorder. So the different meds are valproic acid, Tegretol, and Depakote. So the main side effects are weight gain and then thrombocytopenia. So if they start to experience thrombocytopenia, either we decrease the dosage or just discontinue it. 
Um, some signs and symptoms of thrombocytopenia are that petechiae, bleeding from the gums, bleeding from the nose, or blood in the urine. And then if they're bruised really easily. And then anticonvulsants also have a very wide therapeutic index. So we wanna monitor their blood levels to avoid toxicity. And we um, check their blood levels in the morning before we give them in. So first gen antipsychotics. Remember first gen antipsychotics have a lot more side effects than second gen. So um, first gen decreases dopamine. So the different meds are th Thorazine, Prolixin, ORAP, Haldol, Melaril, and Stelazine. And the big side effects are EPS and NMS. And I'm gonna go over those on the next slide. So EPS, um, I think it's extra pyramidal syndrome, I believe. So it um, can cause dystonia, which are continuous spasm and muscle contractions, akathisia, motor restlessness, or like ants in your pants, Parkinsonism, which is rigidity, bradykinesia, so slow movement, tremor, dysphagia, they can also have tardy, tardive dyskinesia, so irregular jerky movements. They can also um, have frowning, blinking, grimacing, puckering, blowing, smacking, licking, chewing, tongue protrusion, and spastic facial distortion. Um, and then it's also irreversible if it's not treated quickly. And then they can also have that uh, shuffling gait. So with EPS, they have like a lot of Parkinson type of um, side effects. So that's kind of like a good way to remember EPS. And then the antidote for it um, is benzodiazepine or cogentin and Benadryl, and that's used to treat EPS. And then for NMS, remember fever is the first sign. So remember how I said um, when I went over it, when things get hot, Dan is your bro. So because fever is the first sign of NMS, then we want to give dantrolene and then bromocryptine. And those are two anticholinergics. So that's like a really good way to remember NMS. So fever is the first sign, then they'll have tachycardia, confusion, sweating, muscle rigidity, tremor, incontinence, and stupor. But the biggest sign that you need to remember is fever, because then you need to start thinking, okay, if they're experiencing a, th a fever and they're taking a first-gen antipsychotic, then you need to um, bring it back to, okay, give them dantrolene and bromocryptine. And then second gen antipsychotics have a lot less side effects than first gen because um, it blocks less dopamine. So they don't experience any Parkinson side effects. So um, the different meds are Clozaril, Zeprexa, and then Risperidol. We wanna uh, monitor their serum prolactin levels because it can cause stroke. Um, they can also take Geodone, Seroquel, or Abilify. So uh, Clozaril can cause a granulocytosis so these patients might be on neutropenic precautions and we're also monitoring for infection. We're also watching their white blood cell count and then teaching them about symptoms of the flu. And then that was all for the exam one content. I know I went over that like super fast, but you know, it was just kind of like a review. So now we're just gonna go over um, nursing process and standards of care. I only really have one slide for this. Um, but if she gave you guys more notes, I couldn't find my old PowerPoint for this lecture, so I just have the one slide. Um, so mental health nursing assessment. So we want to establish rapport, obtain an understanding of current problems, um, review their physical status and baseline vitals, assess for risk factors affecting safety of the patient and others. Um, we want to perform that mental status exam, so appearance, behavior, speech, mood, disorders of the form of thought perceptual disturbances, cognition, ideas of harming, of harming self or others. Um, we're also assessing their psychosocial status. So ask how treatment became necessary and why they need to start seeking out treatment now. Um, we wanna identify their, uh, the mutual goals for treatment. So what do they wanna see at the end of treatment? Like what are their outcomes? What do they wanna have happen during the course of their treatment? Formulate their plan of care and then document data. Documentation is very important not just with psych patients, but with every patient in general, because you know nurses can get sued if we don't document everything. So we just wanna make sure we're always documenting the things that we do and the things that we talk about with the patient, like any of their concerns, any questions that they might've asked, anything like that. So schizophrenia, which is gonna be a big thing on this exam. And for schizophrenia, uh, I did fix it. So I did put catatonia with the positive um, symptoms. I know I had it on negative on the um, actual schizophrenia PowerPoint. Thank you to um, the student that told me that um, 
Hernandez had it listed as positive. I should have just double checked it with the book. So the different phases, there's four phases of um, schizophrenia. So prodromal, so they have mild changes in thinking, reality testing, and mood. So their symptoms will appear for about one month to one year before they have a full-blown episode. So the um, in the mild phase, they might start to have like odd speech and thoughts. Um, they can also have anxiety, obsessive thoughts, and then compulsive behaviors might be present. Um, the person may feel that they're not right or something is strange. They can also start to deteriorate their work and like school, um, their job performance might be not as well. Concentration might start to lack and then their social functioning might just start to decline as well. Um, acute, so they could, in the acute phase, they're experiencing hallucination, illusions, apathy, social withdrawal, diminished effect, anhedonia, disorganized behavior, impaired judgment and cognitive regression. So they start to have difficulty coping when they're in the acute phase. And so they might need increased support. Well, they will need increased support and hospitalization most likely. So stabilization. So when they get to stabilization, their symptoms are starting to stabilize and they're starting to diminish. So there's a movement towards a previous level of functioning, AKA the baseline. So they'll start to, um, they'll probably be like, uh, discharge from the hospital or maybe just partially and then start to go to outpatient care. Um, they could also receive care in a residential crisis center or a staff supervised uh, residential group home or an apartment. And then maintenance or residual um, phase. So the condition has stabilized and a new baseline is established. So the positive symptoms are normally absent once they get to maintenance, but then they could start to experience negative symptoms and cognitive symptoms. And then the patient may begin to live independently once they get here. Um, so just remember that positive symptoms are the presence of things that shouldn't be there. And then negative symptoms are the absence of things that should be there. So just remember, that's a pretty much the best way to remember that. So what is schizoaffective disorder? It's characterized by the presence of a generally continuous psychotic illness plus intermittent mood episodes. So mood episodes are present for the majority of the total duration of the illness, which can include either one or both of the following. So either major depressive disorder or a manic episode, or it can happen both at the same time. So the different types of positive symptoms, again, is the presence of something that shouldn't be there. So like hallucination, so they can have auditory hallucination. So hearing stuff that isn't there, visual, seeing things that aren't present, command hallucination. So something telling them to do something or like harm themselves or hurt somebody else olfactory, um, smelling things, gustatory, tasting stuff, tactile, uh, pain or discomfort when nothing's touching them. Synesthetic, um, feeling bodily functions such as blood pulsing through their veins, food digesting, uh, urine forming, um, and then kinesthetic, um, sensation of movement while standing motionless. Delusions, so the belief held onto strongly despite evidence that Con contraindicates the belief is what a delusion is. So they can have a grandiose delusion. So the individual has an overinflated sense of worth, power, knowledge, or identity. They can have persecutory. Um, the individual believes that they are someone close to them are being mistreated or that is spying on them or planning to harm them. Somatic, a person believes that he or she has a physical defect or medical problem. Referential or ideas of reference. So. A neutral event is believed to have a special and personal meaning. Paranoia, they're suspicious of other people. Erotomatic, erotomanic, um, believing that somebody else desires them romantically and they don't. Um, nihilistic, delusions of non-existence. Um, they can also have religious delusions. So they think they know everything about the Bible or like any other type of religious text and that they believe they're Jesus or the prophet. Thought broadcasting, others can hear what they're thinking. Um, thought insertion, people have like, they think that people can insert thoughts into their head or they're planning ideas in their head. And then thought control, they believe that others can control their thoughts. And then they can also have disorganized thought. So their thoughts and conversations are logical and like make no sense. They can have bizarre or disorganized behavior. So odd or socially unacceptable behaviors, um, disorganized speech. So they basically just go from one thing to another and they don't really correlate at all. And then they can also have psychosis, so which is a break from reality. 
so their mental state in which a person has difficulty distinguishing reality from their own internal perceptions. And that's kind of what happens in like that acute phase. They start to have that break from reality. They can also have illusions. So in an, an inaccurate perception or misinterpretation of sensory impressions. So hostility or agitation. And then again, I did fix it, like I said. So catatonia would be considered positive. So it's abnormal movement and behavior. Um, repet, repet, I can't even speak right now. <laughs> so they're um, repeating or purposeless overactivity or catalepsy, which is muscle rigidity and fixed posture regardless of stimuli. So catatonic state, um, immobility, stupor, echolalia, echopraxia, automatic behavior, or waxy flexibility, flexibility, waxy flexibility, sorry. So echolalia is a repetition of vocalization. So they're just kind of repeating things. Echopraxia, repetition of another person's actions. And then waxy flexibility, they're like staying like still. Like remember how in the other PowerPoint, I put like a cat kind of frozen. Like think of that when, you see waxy flexibility. So if they're experiencing like a catatonic state, um, what we would do is just sit with them and spend time with them and then still talk to them even if they don't answer, just to keep them you know, engaged and present. Cause they can still hear and like, they can still like, they can still speak, but it just depends. Everybody's different. So like, you know, we still just wanna treat them normally. Oops. Okay, so negative symptoms, again, is the absence of something that should be present. So logia or allogia, the inability to speak, energia or energia, the lack of energy, abolition, lack of interest or motivation and goals, anhedonia, the lack of pleasure, attention deficit, the inability to pay attention, ambivalence, the inability to make decisions because of conflicting emotions. They could also have lack of self-care, um, lack of depend or not lack of dependency, but they could become really dependent. Um, ineffective social skills, um, lack of concrete thinking, and then inability to enjoy activities. Um, they could also experience social discomfort, uh, lack of goal oriented behavior, so taking away from normal behavior. They could also um, start to have a deficit of cognitive symptoms. So attention, memory, abstraction, concept forming, problem solving, and decision making. They could also um, start to show like these types of mood symptoms. So dysphoria, which is a dissatisfaction with life, um, suicidal ideation. So they might want to end their lives or they could start to feel like a lot of hopelessness. So they feel as though it's never going to get better and nothing's going to improve. They could also have either blunt, blunted, flat, or inappropriate affects. So blunted is moderate restriction in facial expressions, flat is severe or no expression, and then in, inappropriate is expressions that don't match the situation. So like if somebody died and they just start like busting out laughing, like that's, appropriate. that's an inappropriate affect. Um, they could also have um, these different um, alterations in speech. So they could have associative looseness. So someone's thoughts are only loosely connected to each other in a person's conversation. So like they kind of connect, but like not really. Um, word salad, a jumble of words that's meaningless to the listener. So random unrelated words strung together. And I think on our second exam, he did like put an example of like word salad. Like, I think that was a question like, it said they were trying to talk and like it just had like a bunch of words. Um, clang association, so choosing words based on their sounds rather than their meaning and often involves words that rhyme, have a similar beginning sound and then neologisms or neologisms, um, words that have a meaning for the patient but different, but a different or non-existent meaning to others. So like making new words that like aren't real. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so to continue on from negative symptoms, they could also have like these types of thought and speech processes. So circumstantial thinking. So someone goes all around their topics, but they still get back to the original point. Tangen tangential thinking. Someone gets off track onto other topics and never get back to the original point. Poverty of speech, minimal speech, or rare to have spontaneous speech. Confabulation, made up memories, illogicality. Thought, uh, their thoughts lack logic when reasoning, thought blocking, an abrupt stop in the middle of a train of thought. The individual may or may not be able to continue the idea. 
pressured speech, unrelenting rapid speech without pauses. It may be difficult to interrupt the speaker and the speaker may continue speaking even when a direct question is asked. Um, flight of ideas, a highly pressured and extreme form of tangential thinking or sometimes loose associations and it's really common in mania. And then preservation, um, involuntary excessive continuation or repetition of a single response, idea or activity. So persistent repetition of words or ideas, even when another person attempts to change the topic. So they'll just keep going on about what they're already talking about. So for diagnosing schizophrenia, a, cl a clinical interview is used to make an official diagnosis. So we'll be taking their history. Oh, well, not us, but like when they're diagnosed. So take their history, hear what the patient and family have to say about what their behavior has been like and observing the patient. Um, schizo diagnosis requires at least two of the following symptoms for at least one month. So delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, gross, grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior, and any of those negative symptoms. So managing hallucinations. Um, okay, so help them increase their awareness so they can distinguish between reality and psychosis. So we're gonna communicate with them because if we, and then like stay with them because if we leave them alone, then their hallucinations can increase. So some interventions, ask them to describe the hallucination and assess content. Um, safety is the number one priority. Again, we wanna decrease stimuli and move patient to a quiet area, focus on reality and respond to patient and respond to real things the patient says. We don't wanna to touch them because it can make the hallucination worse and they could start to experience, you know, those different types of hallucinations. Um, monitor for signs of increasing anxiety or agitation. Do not deny or argue with them about their experience because they're the ones experiencing it, not us. So like we can't say something's not real if we're not the person experiencing that. Um, we wanna help the patient find things to drown out the hallucinations, like listening to music, watching TV, um, concentrating on something else and like not drawing attention to it. And then the different types of spectrum disorders for schizophrenia, so they can have delusional disorder, so delusions that have lasted for more than one month, so normally grandiose, pers persecutory, somatic, or referential, and these delusions aren't severe enough to impair occupational or daily functioning. They could have a brief psychotic episode, so the symptoms must last longer than a day, but they can't last longer than a month. Um, so they have a sudden onset of at least one of the following. So delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, and disorganized or catatonic. So kind of like what it, it will be, uh, sorry, I can't speak. It'll be kind of like the symptoms that they need to get, um, you know, used to diagnose for schizophrenia, but it won't last as long as they need for the diagnosis, if that makes sense. Um, they can also have schizophreniform, which is exactly like schizophrenia, except that those symptoms last less than six months. They can have schizoaffective disorder, which I went over earlier, and then substance-induced psychotic disorder, which can be caused by drugs, alcohol, med medications, or toxin exposure, and they can induce delusions and or hallucinations. It's like uh, an example of like substance-induced psychotic disorder. It's like, you know, like when people get laced and then like they go like crazy, stuff like that. So next we're going over to anger, aggression, violence, seclusion and restraint, because this is also gonna be pretty heavy on the exams, I believe. So um, we wanna make sure like, you know what to ask them for this stuff. Um, I'm sorry, I'm like looking at my other notes so I can like tell you guys like what to kind of focus on. Um, Make sure you know what to do when a, like a patient secluded or restrained. Um, also defense mechanisms are kind of important for anger and aggression and stuff. So make sure you, like how I said, make sure you know the definitions. I didn't read them, but I did upload the proper a couple of days ago just for like a review. So anger disorders describe pathologically aggressive, violent or self-destructive behavior symptomatic of and driven by an underlying and chronically repressed anger or rage. So they result primarily from the long-term mismanagement of anger, and they can also be caused or exacerbated by neurological impairment and substance abuse. So neurotransmitters, um, serotonin can inhibit and stimulate aggressive behavior. So dopamine increases aggression. 
So if they don't have any GABA, it will increase impulsivity and aggressive responses. So that's kind of important to remember for neurotransmitters. So behavioral uh, responses. So passes, passive, it's like if they have a weak voice, little eye contact, slouch arms in their slouch and their arms are crossed. So they give up their rights for others and let people walk all over them. So they never confront the issue. Um, aggressive, they speak loud, maintain uncomfortable eye contact, and they use threatening dress, threatening gestures. So they ignore the rights of others and then everything has to be a fight. So passive aggressive, um, they're, they're sarcastic without being directly insulting. And then assertive, they speak clearly, use personal space, Eye contact is intrusive, so it's not like maintaining uncomfortable eye contact like aggressive people would do. Um, they gesture with speech and posture, so it'll be like erect and relaxed. So ideally, this is what the nurse needs to be. So we have to be assertive. Like we don't want to be passive. We don't want to let patients walk all over us, but we also don't want to be too aggressive. So aggression. Um, aggressive people ignore the rights of others. They think they must fight for their own interests and they expect the same behavior from everybody else. So the aggressive behavior often covers a, bas a basic lack of self-confidence. So hostile behavior is intended to intimidate or cause emotional harm to another, and it can lead to physical aggression. So aggressive behavior are acting out. So it's expressed through lack of cooperation, violation of rules or norms and threatening behavior. So this is considered an immature ego defense mechanism because a person deals with their emotional conflicts or, or stressors through actions rather than through reflection or feelings. So they just like act out instead of thinking like, why, like, like what's causing my conflict? You know, like trying to figure it out internally, they just like lash out. So the person engages in verbal or physical aggression to feel temporarily less helpless or powerless. Um, ego defense mechanism. So violence a lot of times is learned as a coping method and is seen in parents. So the child learns this as an learns this as an acceptable way to cope and uses this method. So if they see like a lot of like violence used in their home as a kid, then they'll grow up thinking like that's okay to use and like it's not. Um, assault to animals is a key sign that a child has been exposed to anger, abuse, or violence and is displacing because remember displacement is an ego defense mechanism, and they're displacing it displacing it on the animals. Dissociative rage. So dissociative rage occurs when a person in the grip of rage doesn't remember what he or she did or did once the rage is over. So it's like they start, they basically like black out, like they get so upset, like get so mad, like they just black out and don't remember anything when they finally come back. And so people kind of have to tell them like what they did, like it's, it's kind of crazy. So interventions during aggression. So during the uh, triggering stage, speak calmly and non-threatening. You wanna convey empathy, you wanna be listening, offering any PRN medications and suggesting retreating to a quiet area. So kind of secluding them. Um, the escalation phase, we wanna use a directive approach. We wanna take control of the situation, still using a calm voice, but we wanna be like more firm with them. Um, and then we want to direct the client to take a time out in a quiet place and then still offering those PRN medications. So during crisis, um, this is when we need the experienced trained staff to come in so they can either initiate seclusion or restraint to deal quickly with the client's aggression and then giving them an IM injection as well. So like an example, like if we're like in a group therapy session and somebody just starts raging out and trying to like harm other people, that's when the staff will come in and seclude them or restrain them. Um, recovery phase, helping the client to relax, assisting them to regain self-control and discussing the aggressive event rationally, so like a debrief. And then the post-crisis phase, the client is reintegrated into the milieu. So some uh, medications that can be given are like anticonvulsants, like carbamazepine and valproate. Um, they can also be given atypical antipsychotics, so like clozapine, clozapine, risperidone, and onlanzapine. And then they can also be given benzos like Ativan and then typical antipsychotics like Haldol. So some of these drugs are given in a cocktail for the crisis phase or alone, such as a benzo in the stages before crisis. So it just depends on where they're at. That'll like determine what med you give. 
predicting violence in a patient. So if they have any previous history of violence, that's like your number one indicator. Um, if they have active psychosis and they're experiencing command hallucinations, remember those command hallucinations are telling them to either harm themselves or harm somebody else. And then substance abuse, they're not in control. So like if they're abusing alcohol or drugs, like they're not in control of their own body. So assessment. So it's important to recognize early verbal and behavioral signs that the patient is becoming agitated so we can intervene to de-escalate the situation. So motor agitation is an early sign of escalating violence. So if they're pacing, this is a really big indicator for people with schizophrenia. If they're unable to sit still, if they're clenching their fists, um, if they're tightening their jaw and facial muscles, so they just start to look upset, that's like a very big early sign for violence. Um, verbal, so it's an, that's an also that's also another early sign of aggression. Um, they're starting to threaten people, threatening like threatening with objects. They're starting to um, demand stuff for attention. They're swearing. They're loud. Um, pressured speech, which is another indicator for schizophrenia, like they're starting to you know become violent. And then if they have like a threatening posture, if they're just towering over somebody. So if you start to notice any of these things, these are things we want to be looking for so we can like start to de-escalate. So if we need to separate these other people from them or take them off by themselves or give them any of those meds, like we need to be aware of what is like a sign of escalating violence or aggression. So patient education. So we wanna help the patient find the cause of their anger. We also wanna let the patient know anger is a normal feeling, but it's never okay to take it out on somebody else. So we need to help them find other ways to take out their anger. So that would be sublimations, so like punching a punching bag or taking a kick, kickboxing class or, you know, something that'll like help them release their anger, like, but like in a socially acceptable way. And then we also wanna teach the patient about confronting the person come causing their anger in a nonviolent way. So we want to teach them how to talk it out or, you know, just like teach them another way to like, you know, approach that person about it. So communication, so our verbal. So this is what we would be doing when dealing with these types of patients. So we want to speak in a calm, low voice. We want to acknowledge the patient's feelings, but um, make them important, but don't ignore them. And we want to validate them as well. We wanna encourage verbalization. So refocus the patient on the problem and not the impulse to act out. So we wanna be asking them open-ended questions, non-threatening questions. So never how, what, and when, and never why. Um, then non-verbal, uh, we wanna uh, remain calm and relaxed, um, make eye contact on the same level as the patient. So we don't wanna be standing over them because they could be threatened by that. And they're already like, like, you know, feeling aggressive and angry. So we wanna be on the same eye level as them. Keep your hands open and out of your pockets and don't cross their arms because again, they could take that as a threat. Give them adequate, adequate space, so about three to eight feet so they don't take you being in their personal space as a threat again. Um, if you approach an angry patient and they back away or show signs of anger, give them their space to prevent anger from escalating. We also wanna send non-threatening messages. So some interventions, again, manage the environment, so prevent their anxiety, show confidence because it prevents panic and prevents miscommunication, um, maintain safety to prevent harm and injury from the patient, um, us ourselves, and then anybody else, um, show concern, so we wanna show empathy for what they're feeling and, and experiencing and aid in their cooperation. We wanna do a disengagement breakaway to prevent injury themselves or others, so remove them out of the situation. Um, removal, seclusion, and restraints to allow the patient to regain their self-control so we can, you know, start to do that debrief and figure out like what caused their anger and like what's a healthier way to cope with it. Also want to document so it's accurate. Remember how I said uh, documentation is really important because we always want to, you know, we want to document things just for legal purposes and to help with the staff. Um, restraints, so physical can be actually holding them down. Seclusion, placing them alone in a room. Um, chemical medications given to restrict movement. Um, patients with restraints or any patients that's secluded, we wanna have them on that one-on-one -on -one supervision. 
And then we're also checking on them every 15 minutes. So we're not neglecting them. So we're checking if they need to use the bathroom, if they need anything to drink, if they're hungry, if they need to do some range of motion exercises or if they need to get up and walk. So just keep that in mind when you have a patient restrained or secluded, we're always checking on them and we're always having that one-on-one -on -one supervision with them as well. So if they say like they're like, you know, their restraints are hurting, we'll loosen their restraints, but also like, Keep the restraints on for your safety, but we don't want to be hurting the patient either. So that's all for anger. So for elders, um, we're going to go ahead and get into that. So some late, late life mental illness, so they can experience delirium, which is an acute fluctuating onset of confusion and disorganized thinking or change in consciousness. So it's common with a significant morbidity and mortality among older adults. It may occur as a reaction to physical illness, meds, or sensory deprivation. It has a sudden onset and it is reversible with treatment. Dementia is a gradual decline in mental ability and it affects short-term memory, reasoning, and abstract thinking. So again, it's gradual, so it starts to happen from months to years, and then it's irreversible. And then depression, it's an illness that affects thoughts, feelings, behavior, and physical health. So it's an unexplained change in mood that persists for more than two weeks, and it's reversible with treatment. So ECT or electroconvulsive therapy is for severe depression and if they're in danger of suicide. So we use this when nothing else has worked. Um, they're not awake during the procedure, they're, they will be sedated. Um, they're NPO before the procedure because of the risk of aspiration. We don't put a bite block on for them because of aspirating again. And then they can um, have retrograde amnesia, which is pretty common after ECT. So they have loss of memory, access to events that occurred or information that was learned before an injury or the onset of the disease. So elder abuse is abuse on an individual that's older than 65. So there's um, five different types. They could have physical, like punching, hitting, kicking, pinching, pushing, biting, emotional put downs, belittling, yelling, screaming, name calling. They have sexual, so inappropriate touching, rape or molestation, neglect, failure to feed, change, give meds, turn, and then economic exploitation. So not paying for work. So using them for their money, like a monthly check. And then um, elder abuse is the same as child abuse. So if, even if you suspect an elder is being abused, you have to report it. So some special considerations for elders, uh, give the person enough time to answer because remember they are older, so it will take them a little bit longer to answer you. Um, questions should be short and to the point. The nurse should rephrase a question if the patient doesn't answer appropriately or hesitates when answering. The setting should be quiet and without distracting noise so they can answer you appropriately. Um, the nurse should speak slowly and in a low pitched voice. We don't wanna be yelling at them, but we also don't wanna be talking as fast so they can still comprehend everything that we're saying. And then the morning may be the best time for the interview for elders. Next is crisis. So what is crisis? It's a temporary state of severe emotional disorganization caused by a failure of coping mechanisms and a lack of support. So the ability for decision-making and problem solving is inadequate. So treatment is aimed at assisting the client and the family through the stressful situation. Crisis is also self-limiting. So they could have increased psychological vulnerability. We also wanna return the patient to their pre-crisis state. We also want them to have personal growth and then anxiety is felt and seen. And then a, person, a patient perceives a threat to integrity and feels as though it's life-threatening. So they can have four different types of crisis. So maturational, so normal transitions that changes their self-perception. So like childbirth, marriage, or going from a kid to a teen. Situational an external event that is unexpected and messes with an individual's equilibrium. So like if they have a change in their finances, they lose a job, if they get divorced or somebody in their family dies. And adventitious, a disaster or, ev or event that is not a part of life. So like a fire, hurricane, earthquake, riots, rape, murder, or violence. Um, and then cultural, like culture shock. So like a soldier returning home from a country, returning home from overseas or like moving to a new country or anything like that, like going to a new school. So our goals for crisis are to remain free of self-harm, remain free of harm to others, 
identify the specific problem triggering their crisis, um, the patient needs to verbalize thoughts and feelings of the trigger, and the patient needs to participate in forming an action plan as well. So, and then uh, crisis assessment. So we wanna assess their history of past crisis, what's causing their crisis, um, figure out the patient's perception of crisis, validate feelings and be non-judgmental, um, acknowledge their strengths, empower them, and then assess for any potential for self-harm or harm to others. And then we also, um, for the interventions, we wanna develop a concrete plan of action to deal directly with the current crisis have a concrete plan um, that restores the, the patient's equilibrium and psychological balance. We wanna give a directive approach. Um, initially, the nurse may make phone calls and then guide the individual through the problem solving process by which he or she may move in the direction of positive change. And lastly, we're gonna do dying, death, and grieving. Oops, sorry. So the different types of loss are actual, which is like losing a spouse, a limb, or a job. Perceived, um, the individual can feel, but we cannot. So like loss of youth or independence. Anticipated, um, anticipate something that's to come, like the diagnosis of incurable cancer. Physical, like loss of sight. And then psychological, like a recent mental illness diagnosis, like schizophrenia or depression. So some models for end-of-life care, so hospice. Um, supports and care for patients facing death. If they're, they'll be put on hospice if their life expect. Ugh, sorry guys, if their life expectancy is less than six months, um, it's available to everyone regardless of age, diagnosis, or their ability ability to pay. Um, palliative care, the patient, it's patient and family centered. It's caring for those with incurable chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, dementia, things like that. Um, we want to promote patient autonomy and then access to information and choice. And then we also want to treat these patients and prevent them from suffering. So like use methods to sedate or reduce pain for them, anything like that. Grieving, so it's a normal response. There's no clear ending. So when somebody is grieving, they should have decreased sadness, anger, and eventually acceptance. So for adults, it's within one year. And then within with children, it's within six months. Um, so some normal signs and symptoms are excessive crying, anxiety, fatigue, insomnia, anger, change in appetite, depression. Um, mourning refers to things people do to cope with the grief. So sharing social expressions of grief, like viewing hours, funerals. Um, everyone grieves, but not everyone engages in mourning. And then if changes in grief processes have not occurred, it means that the patient is experiencing complicated grief. Complicated grieving occurs in two to 5% of cases. So it's persistent bereavement disorder. So for adults, it, if their grieving lasts for longer than 12 months and then for children, if it lasts longer for six months. Um, so the hallmark signs and symptoms of complicated grieving are time, because remember with normal grief, it should be resolved in about a year for adults and six months for kids. And then if they can't norm function normally, so the outcome um, for complicated grieving, we want them to experience grief resolution. So some signs and symptoms of complicated grieving are empty, anger, disbelief, detachment, self-blame, inability to move on, suicidal ideations, um, urge to self-harm. So some interventions are like talking to a psychiatrist, drug therapy, you know, just having a support system. And then Kubler-Ross, um, he came up with like the five stages of grieving, I believe. So denial, isolation. So the patient is in disbelief or shock about the situation. Sorry, I don't know why I put shock. Um, so like an example is like, there has been a mix up with the test results that they get back, like they have cancer. Anger um, surfaces when the patient is ready to acknowledge the situation. So it'll be like, why me? Bargaining as the patient attempts to deal with overwhelming feel feelings vulnerability and helplessness, they may secretly try to make deals with a higher power to prolong their life. So like, I'll stop smoking if I can just stay long enough to attend my daughter's wedding if they're diagnosed with like lung cancer. Depression, this phase arises when the patient can no longer avoid the sense of great loss and then acceptance. So they might, be, they might not be as talkative 
Um, and then a time of silence may be the most meaningful. And then another thing I forgot to put on the slide is that um, we don't always experience these like five steps like in order. So it might not always be denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. It could be bargaining, anger, then denial. You know, like it just depends on the person. So that's really all for um, the review. Let me see if I have anything else I can add to this to help you guys. Okay, guys, so really just um, just like some last minute type of stuff. So just make sure you know, like, again, the different types of hallucinations and delusions. Um, you know, um, know what to do when a patient is secluded, what do we do after? Um, you know, just like know like the signs and symptoms of everything. Like, I feel like you guys will be okay. Whenever we were doing practice questions, you guys were getting them all like generally right. If you can find any type of practice questions online, definitely do those. Look over those practice questions, like PowerPoints that I uploaded. Make sure you're reading rationales. Another good thing I would uh, do for studying for um, psych is I would just go on Quizlet and just look up like practice psych questions. And that was really helpful for me as well. So yeah, just keep reviewing. You guys will be fine. Um, hopefully this helped you guys out. I know I was talking like super fast, but it's just so I could get it uploaded because I just been having like so many like laptop issues. So hopefully this was helpful. I will get this uploaded as soon as it's done converting and good luck studying. You guys will do great on your exam tomorrow. Don't stress about it. Be confident in everything that you guys have been studying. I know you guys will do very well. So good luck, everybody.